morning. We will call this meeting, this work session to order. Thank you for being here this morning. Public comment. Uh, we respect our citizens' rights to address their government in this meeting. However, I enforce, uh, I intend to enforce our three-minute rule in order for this meeting to run efficiently and effectively. Once you reach your three minutes, uh, I will ask you to wrap your sentence up and then the floor will be taken back by me. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or official, officials which should be handled in another forum other than a uh, business meeting of this body. Uh, clerk, do we have anyone signed up? Yes, ma'am. So we have four individuals this morning, or four citizens who have signed up this morning. First, we have Mr. Wayne Rogers. Mr. Rogers, would you please come forth, uh, go to the podium, please, and give us your address and your subject matter is coroner. My address is 5110 Gray Road. Can, can you go to the podium? Well, I, I'm going to pass anyway, if that's oh. okay. You still want me to? Oh, you're going to pass? I'm going to pass. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, next we have Mr. Ted Meeker. Mr. Meeker, please come forward. Good morning to the chair and board. My name is Ted Meeker. My business address is 14 East Broad Street, Noonan, Georgia. I'm a lawyer with the firm of Sumner Meeker. I'm here this morning on behalf of the Douglas County People's Action Committee. There's a letter being passed out addressed to the county attorney. You are also receiving copies. In short, we have submitted a series of open records requests regarding the bus system startup application that is pending with ARC. Uh, what we have found is that there's been a series of actions taken by the Transportation Committee. There is some concern on my part from a legal standpoint as to whether notice of those transportation, uh, transportation Committee meetings was legally sufficient. More importantly, there's been a lack of follow-up action by this board with respect to the application that has been submitted and revised um, with the ARC. Um, I would remind you, of course, that this board is the elected body of Douglas County and not the Transportation Committee. We think it's imperative that this board slow the process down and thoroughly review exactly what is being applied for with the ARC, as well as the financial feasibility of what is being sought. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Ted Meeker. We appreciate your uh, contribution to this meeting and we'll take this matter under advisement. Uh, next we have Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, please come forward and give us your address once again and your subject matter. Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Well, I hope everybody had a, a good fourth and celebrate. I was on the Chattahoochee River. I did a lot of thinking while I was out there because I was in a small tube with a motor by myself. So, the hot news right now is Mr. Rogers, who's sitting over here, was dismissed by the coroner twice. First time, she said, hit the road, Jack. And then she rescinded it three days later. Said, oops, kind of made a boo-boo. You got uh, 30 days warning, so you can come back. So after about 30 days or so, she said, I see you. bye. Mr. Rogers has never received this letter of separation yet. Now, when it was said by her, and I quote, I'm an elected officer by the people, and I run my boat, my office, the way I see fit. Well, let me tell you what she's doing. She's doing it again, laughing at you again, right here, He's going to replace Mr. Rogers. Now, Mr. Rogers was one of three, Usher, who was at Willie Watkins, and Mr. Axel, Mr. Rogers. And he was the original one with her during the campaign, loyally supporting her and all that. And within 90 days, he gets canned in regards to his chief recognition and gives it to Mr. Axley. Now, if he left on his own accord, I'd say, Mr. Teal and Human Resources, I'd like to replace her. Ah, he didn't leave on his own accord. 
she said, you're out of here. And I won't go into the reasons why, but I know why. Okay. So here she is here going to hire somebody 26 miles away, and his name is Nathan Womack. <clears throat> now, let me tell you how smart some people are here. Judge Hemrick gets an email, and the email says, hey, I'd like for you to uh, swear this new man to hire. <laughs> Guess what Judge Hal Hemrick says? No, ma'am, I can't swear him in because it has to go before the Board of Commissioners for approval for his training. See, that costs money. So I just want to let you know that I get calls, I get letters. A bird comes over to my house and drops messages. So consequently, what I'm trying to tell you again is she's running her boat the way she wants to, and she cannot hire anybody until it comes before you. That B section number two on 451607 says she's allowed more deputies. Not deputies blanket statement, but blanket if she brings it up to you for approval. If she got rid of him, that means she didn't need him. Mr. She didn't need him. Okay, wait a minute. She didn't need him. Excuse me. You have exceeded your She didn't need him. And if she didn't need him, she doesn't need another one. I understand. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take this matter under advisement. Actually, I gave you about 48 seconds over. So thank you, Mr. Pierce. I'll pay the coming later. Oh, right. I appreciate you walking me in this morning, so I'll just consider that we write it off. Uh, Mr. Dwight Burke, please come forward. Mr. Burke, give us your address and uh, your subject matter, please. I believe at 5579 Yorkshire Court, Douglasville, Georgia. I'm here to talk about the proposal for the new brunch law moving from 1230 to 1130. So as, as you know, it says the Don Burke Squirrel. Well, I call myself the owner. Everybody else in Douglas County calls me Peggy's assistant manager. <laughs> <laughs> when I retired from Red Lobster, the, the goal of what we wanted to do with Burke's Grill is we thought there was a need for some place local that people could go and take their families to and have something to brag about. We've been in existence eight years. In that eight years, we've tried to do everything we can to make Douglas County a better place. We try to put more into the county than we take back. Um, talking to our accountant Friday, we have the Captain Herbs Fund, which feeds every police officer, first responder, people in military uh, uniforms. We feed them free. That's what Captain Herb used to do. We're good friends with Karen Emery. It's something we wanted to continue to do. After six years of existence with that program, it's fed $79,000 worth of discounted meals. So we put that back into the community. Our daughter teaches Special Olympic swim team. I cook, I teach cooking classes at the Danny House. New Lou Martinez as well. This is, all I ask is when we look at this, that it makes us a level playing field with people around us. If it gives us an opportunity to increase sales, even if it's just one mimosa, an hour early, it's going to go right back into the community. And the people that we think it influences, I grew up in the Bible Belt here in Georgia. I remember when you couldn't drink on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I, I can understand where we stand. I, I came from there. But I understand that now, it says, if it's an opportunity for us to be a little bit more successful and do more for Douglas County, that's what we're going to do with that. We're not out there on the side pushing beer, wine, and mimosas, that's what we're all about. I just ask when you take a look at this thing, that we take a look at what's good for everybody, not just Burke Squirrel, but the people of Douglas County. That's all that I ask. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Burke, I appreciate you coming in, and we'll take this matter on your advisement as well. Last but not least, we have Mr. John Tomaski. Mr. Tomaski, please come forward, give us your address and your subject matter. Please. Uh, 2929 Post Road, Winston. I'll be talking about uh, structure and process. Uh, last time I was here, I spoke on the matter of uh, fiduciary responsibility and ways in which it's exercised. And I mentioned that since this body has no rules and each commissioner <coughs> has the mandate of an elected officer, 
that they pretty much can do whatever they feel is in the county's best interests <coughs> without restriction other than it not be inconsistent with existing law. Now, at this point, I will indicate what I believe is the standard structure <coughs> for legislative bodies, and that his matters at the outset are set forth by enunciating rules, and this includes what are the committees, who are the offices, all these sorts of things, and a backup set of rules, whether it's Roberts, Mason, this is Demeter, or whatever. And when an issue comes up, such as fiduciary responsibility, this would be something normally that would be referred by any member through communication to the Finance Committee. It goes on their agenda, they deliberate it, they report back to the body. And then the body votes on whatever action they might deem appropriate. So we don't have, so to speak, free range commissioners. But if that's the way the body wants to proceed and the voters continue to elect them on that basis, well, that's fine too. I'm just indicating that to avoid problems of miscommunication and misunderstood intentions, that structure is helpful. If we all like things to be free range, that's fine too. But consequent disruptions, such that we hear about from time to time from various other public commentators, will continue. And fiduciary responsibility also, apparently, like beauty, can be in the eye of the beholder. Because I observe many instances where what is done is very much counter to fiduciary responsibility, and in fact, <coughs> conscientiously so. Again, that's my opinion, but I believe that there is fact and logic to support that opinion. If there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, you'll have a good day. Thank you so much, Mr. Tomaski, for coming in. We'll take your, uh, this matter under advisement. We appreciate you coming in today. Next, we have the approval of the minutes. Um, commissioners, please take a look at these minutes, and uh, we will move forward with the approval on tomorrow. Um, next, we have a resolution. We have two resolutions today. Tab number four, resolution authorizing the filing of a condemnation petitions to acquire the required right of way and easements on various parcels for the purpose of facilitating the construction of roadway projects. Um, Director Valentin. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, this resolution uh, will authorize, it upon approval, the acquisition of a total of six parcels, and by parcels we mean slivers of land along the frontage of the properties. One parcel on the Highway 5 uh, dual uh, trend lane uh, project. Uh, two parcels on the Maximum Road widening project at uh, uh, Thornton Road, and one parcel, two parcels at the Stewart Mill and West Stewart Mill and Yancey Road project. Now, the last project, those two parcels are on either side of the intersection, on either side of West Stewart, uh, Stewart Mill Road, and that is one of the reasons why the project is on hold. Yeah, it is, uh, and, uh, the acquisition of these parcels was delayed and the project went through the process with the Georgia DOT uh, and it was awarded and construction began. But uh, even though there's been uh, ongoing negotiations with the property owners, uh, we have not been able to come to an agreement on that one. The Highway 5, Parcel, uh, and there were two parcels. We've been able to reach an agreement on one, but not the other. Uh, the one on the corner, the uh, uh, Walgreens. And the parcels on Maxim Road at Thornton Road, one of them is also a Walgreens. And the other one is another business, uh, I believe, uh, related to the Kroger. Uh, there have been considerable uh, uh, outreach to these uh, property owners. 
uh, on the parcel related to the Highway 5 project. The initial contact was made on April 13, 2018. On the two parcels related to the Maxim Road project, uh, initial contact was April 26, 2017. And uh, the, the two parcels on uh, Stuart Mill Road at West Stuart Mill Yancey, first contact was February 26, 2018. So uh, this resolution is aiming to uh, get the authorization for us to proceed with condemnation proceedings should it become necessary. Now, the process uh, following the federal guidelines requires that we give them one last opportunity to reach an agreement with the county. So upon the approval of the resolution, we will reach out to all these property owners with uh, one final opportunity to reach a settlement prior to us uh, proceeding with this. Uh, the, uh, the, par uh, the parcels on uh, both the Highway 5 and the Maxim Road project, we must have uh, those parcels under uh, either under contract or a filing by the end of July to be able to stay on schedule on both of those projects. Uh, one related to Stuart Mill at Yancey. Uh, the project is on hold uh, due to the lack of those two parcels. So uh, timing is of the essence of all of them. Okay. Any questions from the board commissioners? Commissioner Guider. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, on Highway 5, um, this is for the two turning lanes. Southbound south. to the left turn lane, yes, ma'am. Okay, it, it has nothing to do with the northbound it turn doesn't. lane. Um, and when was the first notice given? April 13, 2018. 18. Mm -hmm. No follow up since then. There's been a considerable back and forth, uh, but uh, they will uh, indicate that their response is forthcoming and it's forthcoming, and uh, as of this date, it hasn't. And well, so, I mean, if we know that we have to give them another notice, I mean, we talked about this in our last meeting in, in June. Could we have not given the notice then? And let the clock be running on that notice. Now we're we're going to be delaying it even further. Um, do we have somebody assigned to the right of ways in your department? We do, and and Madam Chair, to, to your initial question, the the federal guidelines require a certain process, and so upon authorization to file a condemnation petition. There has to be one last opportunity to reach an agreement before you actually uh, do the filing. So even though we have been going back and forth with them for several months uh, and trying to urge them to, to uh, settle uh, or to come to an agreement with us, uh, we cannot give them the final notice until the authorization is given by the board. But this been a, um, a state project. They knew about the right of way need uh, from the very get go, mm -hmm. and so I'm sure we filed some papers trying to get them to uh, come to some agreement where we could purchase the right of way. And uh, so it's been laying down there all this time, right? Mm -hmm. And we haven't done any kind of follow up since then. Uh, so it just seems like we could have started to kind of, if we we're going to have to condemn, I know we don't like to condemn, property. nobody likes to condemn property, mm -hmm. but this is a state project that's been going on. We knew it had to be that we had to acquire that right away in order to complete the project. We've got the funds from the state, and the federal or whatever, and uh, so it just seems like we've dropped the ball too, that we should have started the proceedings uh, earlier than now as far as right, uh, the condemnation. We've got to condemn it, we've got to condemn it. Um, but uh, 
But that's that's just on that's my personal opinion on that one. <laughs> uh, on uh, Yancey Road and Stuart Mill, I can't understand how the bid was ever let without the right way already acquired. <clears throat> um, this is a county project. The bids uh, uh, we we let the bid what sometime last year sometime. Mm -hmm. Someone should have looked at that file and said, we got everything in order. And, but for that equipment to be sitting there during the summer months and every, nobody's doing anything because two little right ways. This is something that we should have caught a long time ago. I'm not blaming you. I'm talking, somewhere we dropped the ball is what I'm saying. Yeah. I know that uh, you, you were new well, I wasn't here at the time the project was Okay, built. but when you start a project and you're about to let the bid, somebody should have reviewed the file, is all I'm saying. Um, and we should have caught this a long time ago and started the proceedings on acquiring. And these are just slithers of property. Is it on the Yancey side or is it on... Is it on two sides of the road? It's on both sides of uh, Stuart Mill. Yes. And they can't work around those um, because no. uh, every corner has been going to be some, nice. some of the utilities have to be located so close to the property line <coughs> that the contractor is hesitant to go on there for fear of trespassing on to. Well, property. my suggestion in the future. Before we let a bid out, we, we need to make sure all the T's have been crossed and the I's have been dotted. It's just review. Review the file, make sure we got our ducks in a row so that I'm sure it's going to cost us money with that equipment sitting there not being operated. And it, it's going to have to cost us money because they're diverting, having to divert their crews somewhere else or whatever. Uh, have they talked to you about what this is going to cost to come back to bite us? They, have, they haven't, uh, and the initial review of the project timeline indicated that they probably have more time allocated to the project than they needed. So uh, I do not necessarily foresee that they will come back with a request for an extra because while they're not working here, they're working somewhere else. So how long does the condemnation process, uh, how long does it last? We've got to give them, what, 30 days? 30 notice? days, 30 days. And um, then from there, we've got to make the filing into the court, Correct. pay the money into the court system, and whatever. Um, so um, I'm just saying, we should have foreseen some of this coming. <laughs> and the thing about the Stuart Mill and the Yancey is school is out now. It would have been the opportune time to finish, you know, get most of that done. And now the equipment is just sitting there and school will be starting in about a month. So um, we need to review the files before we even let the bid. Make Understood. sure we've got everything done before. We Understood, and, and I would have done that had I been here at the time. But uh, the project—you weren't was here when we let the bid out. No, ma'am. Okay. It was prior but to my somebody in the department—I don't—I'm not saying it's you. I'm saying somebody in the department needs to be following up on things. Understood. Okay, I hear that. Any other questions from board commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Monroe. Maxim. Yes. How big are those parcels? You said two, right? Two parcels. Um, the parcels in total are fairly good size, but right. the slivers might be 10 foot wide by 150 feet. Right, around the edge. And this is regarding the, the, the intersection, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And we're at the final stages of the design on that one, though, right? That is correct. Right, so, and so. Uh, it, it's before you, almost before uh, BM and BM, before Mark, this project has been going on quite some time. Um, um, as we know that um, the intersection of um, um, State Route 6 and uh, Maxim Road, which is Thornton, 
is one of the most deadly intersections um, in the state of Georgia. Uh, there's so many accidents as relates to per vehicle to human uh, pedestrian. And so it's one that we've always followed. Uh, we, we, we recognize we, we had an accident um, down Maxim Road. Where we had um, um, a pedestrian um, and a car accident late at night. Uh, we know we have some sidewalk challenges along there. So this is something that we've been, um, and, and it's the most traffic. I mean, if you think about where, how Thornton Road backs up at the highway, um, you have the traffic that is pouring in from Max Road, which is Cobb County, and obviously you've got up uh, C. James Parkway coming from the north side, coming down, and that's a lot of volume. I mean, Thornton Road is the most voluminous road in the county other than I-20, by far, right? And so we're trying to, we've been working on this for quite some time. We're trying to do a better job of sort of smoothing out, is that the right word, smoothing out that whole area as it relates to Thorn Road. Uh, but this intersection right here, uh, this condemnation, we, we, we plan, we know we might have had to do that. Um, is there any other obstacle beyond that that this project will be ready to go? Barring, I know we had some creek work, a little stream work. Can you talk about we that? Do not, we do not anticipate uh, uh, any issues with the other parcels. Okay. We have actually reached agreement on some of them and others uh, we anticipate that we will in the very near future so these are the ones that, and again we uh, we are seeking the authority to be able to do this but we're still hopeful that we can avoid it uh, but the timing it is part of the issue the, the urgency to uh, be in position to do the filing uh, because otherwise it could potentially put the uh, federal funding in jeopardy on this project. So, so, so maybe to Madam Guider's point, I mean, I appreciate it. It sounds like you're trying to anticipate, trying to avoid further delays. Um, and so I, I appreciate the comments that was both hers and yours. Um, but back to Max Road, um, once this, this process is done, um, specific to that project, where we are as far as moving forward? We should be able to, um, within a couple of months, certify right of way. Yep and finalize the design and then the project will be certified for construction. Okay, and that's, that's about an 18 month process thereafter? Uh, probably a little less than that, but 18 months, uh, within 18 months for sure. Okay. Absolutely, that's all I need, Madam Chair, you Okay, any other questions for the I just have one comment, um, thank you so much, uh, Director Valentin. Um, that work on the Yancey and uh, Stuart Mill corridor um, it's looking real good, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Guider that uh, certainly was moving, and I thought it was moving full steam mm -hmm. ahead. I come that way every morning, uh, coming in, and um, but I just wanted to just uh, soften the blow a little bit for you because uh, this project has been on the books since 2002, and uh, that's a long time. So you're cleaning up somebody else's mess. So thank you so much for what you've done, and I appreciate you. Um, and I know you have to go back and look at it, and hopefully, the owners will allow us to. Um, have those easements and right or right ways without con uh, condemnation because that's really something that we try to pull it. So I appreciate you. Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much. We'll move forward to number five. Number five is a resolution to call for an election of the voters of Douglas County to authorize Douglas County to permit and regulate Sunday sales of distilled spirits of alcoholic beverages for beverage purposes by the drink from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. approving the form of ballot to be used in such election or for other purposes, legal department. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, this is Senate Bill 17 known as the Sunday Brunch Bill. Uh, the Sunday Brunch Bill, which was signed in the law, allows uh, the county to go back to the voters by referendum to seek to add an hour and a half on Sunday sales primarily or for exclusively uh, restaurants that sell, that have 50% of their gross sales or more in food or prepared meals, or hotels that 50% uh, or more of their gross annual uh, sales are derived from lodging. And um, we were asked to prepare this, <coughs> if approved by this board, it'll be on November 6th ballot. The city also has got the same identical, well, the language in the resolution is a little bit different, but the actual ballot question is identical and the city is going back for the same time period. So while it may be a little bit confusing, essentially the ballot question would be, does the county have authority on premise consumption of alcohol and still spirits from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m.? It's an hour and a half. Okay. Um, any questions from the board commissioners for, for our attorney? 
uh, Commissioner Robinson. Sure. Um, yeah. Again, you know, the, the county's come a long way in evolving from it wasn't too long ago when there was you know, great opposition to just having alcohol on Sunday at all, recognizing now it's evolved to a point where we're, we're, we're expanding the hours um, to a certain extent to accommodate what was always an economic development um, component. Um, Ken, yes, sir. question for you. Um, so it's going to be on the ballot. Um, is there a requirement of the state law that says that we must uh, talk to the public at all, or is it just we just go straight to the, the referendum? The, the, you, the, what y'all decide to do as far as uh, dissemination of information yeah, public is that be all, but no. The board simply has to, by resolution, within a certain time frame, and okay. we've calculated the time frame and worked with Milton downstairs at the Board of Elections to figure out what that time frame is. Yeah. Is Milton here? Hey, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, hey. There's, there he is. But anyway, long story short, there's a time frame uh, that the legislature has set forward when the resolution, what triggers the Board of Elections call for a referendum. Uh, those are trigger points, and we're in the trigger point for that essentially um, and so I don't know if that answered your question. No, no you did and, and again I, I just want to and I'm sure my peers have their own commentaries as far as the, the commercial establishments that are within their respective districts and um, their desire for it as well as for the constituents but as far as timing concerned <laughs> again it just sounds like it will be on November 6th that's really what I was getting at and it's July. So. Yeah, if if y'all approve this resolution, yes. it'll Thank trigger you. it'll trigger a call by the Board of Elections and Registration yep. built to okay. uh, can address that. But he's got a window in which he has to call. But the biggest challenge for the Board of Elections and Registration is ballot prep since everything's technical now. And so they probably if y'all approve this resolution tomorrow they will probably start ballot building, yep. but they will not formally call the election until they get within the window. And I think the window is not sooner than 30 days, not later than 60 days from their call. And Milton, I will work on the exact date. I think yes. we've talked about that a little bit, so he's got the trigger points. Okay, I'm going to yield to my colleagues. I, I yield them, Chair. There, uh, one, one that last question. There is a notice requirement when you have a call, and that notice will be published as part of, y'all. if y'all approve this resolution, there'll be notices that are published by the Board of Election Registration as to the call. But as far as dissemination of information, the county cannot spend taxpayer dollars on anything other than truthful information about whatever it is. They can't campaign for or against a ballot measure. Do they know it? Thank you. Okay. Any other comment before I uh, ask uh, Director Kidd to take over for just a second? Okay, Director Kidd, you have a comment? Or Basically, what the county is trying to do is trying to mirror legislation that the largest municipality for the, the county, which is the city of Douglasville, is already passing. They've already submitted the resolution to our office to be a, voted on and approved by the Board of Elections and Registration. So what you all are basically leveling the playing field for those entities that are specifically county entities and are not located within the city. It, it's a resolution that most of the counties in Georgia, since the governor signed that particular legislation, are moving forward to in order to, I guess, make it more uniform for the local establishments that are within your county. Like uh, the board's attorney stated, there is a time frame that all of this has to happen uh, <coughs> within in order to be viable for the November 6th election and not actually have to spend undue taxpayer money to call for a special election since we already have an election scheduled for this date and time. Okay. Any questions for uh, Director Kidd? Sounds like it's pretty self-explanatory. You say uniformity, that makes sense, and in tandem, and, and then we don't want to waste the taxpayers' money by special election. Okay, well, any other questions? Do you have any other, other comments, Attorney? No, Madam Chair. Sure. Okay, all right, thank you. We're gonna move on to tab. Uh, first of all, I wanna ask the County Administrator, do you have any Mm -hmm. Contribution this morning. Listeners items, we have 10 this morning. Tab number six, authorization to create a new contract attorney position in the juvenile public defender's office and amend the budget to cover benefits. Judge Walker. Oh, I see Judge, Judge Harrison. Harrison. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I know y'all keep expecting Judge Walker. <laughs> <laughs> I finished court early, so I volunteered to come over. Okay. Um, so what we are asking after having a stakeholders meeting and um, our administrative council 
Um, we had a contract attorney, Carolyn Altman, who is now the juvenile court judge in Paulding County, um, leave us and we have her contract that instead of replacing her uh, person in that contract, we want to take that contract money and turn it into a salary to complement the um, juvenile public defender that we are replacing uh, that we came to a few months ago um, about replacing for Ms. Brumblow. And um, so what we would ask is that that contract actually be moved into a salary. We have some extra funding from um, the space realignment um, that we were going to use towards putting toward um, the benefits for that person. That person would serve as a backup to our public defender and also work in dependency court. Okay, any questions from the board of commissioners or comments? Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. So the benefits for that position are $25,000. Um, so if there's not enough funds to cover, the difference would have to be, the budget would have to be amended. Okay. And according to Judge Walker, there was not. There was, that wasn't going to be an issue. Okay. So it's budget neutral, basically. Okay. That's what we said. But okay. yes, I think, I think that was what her thinking was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from board? Do you all have any comments? You know? Okay. Madam Chair, I, I think technically for the purpose of the line item, and I'll go back and check with Jennifer, she's moving today. Um, we probably need to make the uh, the line item also read authorize the chairman to sign all related documents because I think these are signed by you on behalf of the juvenile court, but I'll check in, Peggy. I think they're both signed. Uh, but if that's the case, well, we're asking for authorization for you to sign whatever. Okay. Is finance all right with the mm -hmm. line item? Is that okay. it? Thank that you. Easy. Thank that you. Was very easy. Tab number seven. Uh, authorization to accept a CJJC grant in the amount of $448,937 with a match of $49,882 from the Douglas County, or should I say the Douglas Circuit Accountability Courts Drug and Mental Health Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Director uh, Pruitt, how are you this morning? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is our standard CJCC grant. It is an increase over the grant that we've had from previous years, which mirrors the growth that we've experienced in the accountability courts. Uh, it is a typical operation for us to apply for this grant every year. It is the majority of our funding source. Uh, and it is what I believe to be a sign of support that we continue to see increases in this grant while we increase the services we provide to the county. Okay, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Geiger? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kim, how much of an increase is it from About $150,000. That's good. Pardon? About $150,000. Oh, $150,000 from last year. From right? last year. That's great. That's great. It is a significant increase. And do you have your numbers today? How many is in your accountability court? It's 94. 94. Yes, ma'am. How many did you have last year? Do you remember? At this time, maybe 32. Okay. Wow. So oh, it has been a significant increase. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're doing good work. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. That's excellent. Any other comment from the Board of Commissioners? So we'll move on to the next tab. Yeah, sure. okay. Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, I, I, I would. I'd be remiss if I didn't say anything. Again, thank you for, for what you guys are doing over there. I'm sure you're aware of the new Community Service Bureau building that's come, that came online recently and, and what we're trying to do. And again, we're trying to improve the infrastructure as relates to mental health and accountability courts and, and working alongside both prevention and intervention. Um, this, this money, in addition to what the Board of Commissioners provided you guys, um, one of the components that's still missing is housing. Do you anticipate that being something formally we can address in the near-term future, or what are you thinking? What are you guys thought so far? We do still try to cobble together solutions for housing, but our solutions are uh, two beds at a time, three beds at a time, four beds at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not been able to plan for a larger solution than that at any given point. Uh, Judge McLean will actually be coming to this board in the near future to discuss a partnership with one of our local churches which gives another four beds coming online. 
Uh, so we'll continue to add those resources as we can. Yeah. The funding for housing in this grant was fairly small. Uh, and not in terms of rent, it would never pay rent. It might pay utilities. Uh, so we do ask for housing money every year. Uh, and this is a significant increase and I'm very happy to have this increase. I did ask for more. And housing was one of the line items that I asked for more under. Right. Uh, and I will continue to do that as we go forward because housing is a huge problem nice. for our accountability boards and for the community in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will work with the solutions that we have and keep asking for better solutions in the future. You, you've answered our question. I mean, again, you talk about stabilizing the infrastructure. Housing is key. I mean, you, you bring them in, they're outpatient, you send them wherever they got to go, but they've got to be a stable environment. You can't send them back to where they came out of sometimes uh, accordingly. Um, it, in housing is it expensive. I think based on the population and the numbers, um, if it, if it gives us a capacity to be able to forecast. Uh, one of the responsibilities the board commissioner has alongside of you guys is to make sure we have adequate funding, filling the gaps where grants and so forth can't, can't support. So again, keeping up with the numbers, sharing that with us, um, it, it helps us. Um, and um, I, I think there are some funding solutions like NSP and some other things that we know we've looked at that we can take a look at. I'll, I'll continue, to, and this, not to put you or the judge on, on, on point here, it's more of to open the public discussion about policy and how we approach this. So it, we're leaving these breadcrumbs, as I say, along the way to say, yeah, we have had these dialogues. Yes, we have talked about this. Absolutely. And so when we come to a point where we make a decision, it's not like a surprise, but it's something that we, we stay on. So that was all. I just wanted to mark this moment and pin it. I yield back to you. Thank you. Commissioner Guider? Yes, I, I'd like to just... Uh, Get a report on the houses or the housing that you have ongoing out at the old landfill at the landfill that project continues to be a success we have turned those beds over at least twice already meaning that we have three active beds at that facility that is a female facility and that means that we've put six women through that facility and they are in sustainable housing now so they have moved from a state of homelessness to a state of supportive or of permanent housing on their own we're not subsidizing their housing once they leave this. Uh, we have another three females in there now. We are full. Uh, we work with the local shelters to support our people getting into the shelter before they come into this housing so that we can give them enough time to get on their feet. Uh, the way that we can turn those beds over so fast is by working with the resources we have. So we turn those beds over twice so far and about to turn them over a third time. On, on, on the women's shelter there, mm -hmm. um, you came before us uh, at one time to talk about what the fire marshal required uh, on a limited number of females in that yes, house. And we were going to waive it locally. Uh, were you able to increase the number for that house? We have not increased the number for the house. Even though we can waive certain parts of that, which would be the sprinkler system, which was the biggest issue of concern. There are other components that would still be cost prohibitive for us to increase the number of people in that building. And I've presented uh, those can numbers. You, can you give us a heads up on that? I could, if I can remember the actual number, I absolutely Well, it's a, I know it's a two bedroom, I mean a two bathroom, Correct. Uh, three bedroom house, Correct. but there was the also the porch or the uh, sunroom. sunroom that was added uh, and I could see you know even the dining room being a, a bedroom so I don't understand why we could not go forward with uh, adding another person one of the things that was very cost prohibitive was not just the sprinkler system itself but also the alarm system uh, if you remember the architecture of that house uh, the main area there is open um, to the ceiling. Uh, so one of the uh, alarm and suppression systems that had to be installed was going to be oh, you can't just have a fire eight or nine thousand dollars thing that you have in a house no ma'am yeah, that was I never could understand that a home can have five kids and two adults Yes, ma'am. But we can't put more in that house. I don't understand that at all. I'm really speaking for the fire marshal at this point, and so I'll, I'll yield to the fire marshal and <laughs> say I am really speaking out of my wheelhouse and, and relaying third-party information. 
and in court we get real crazy about third party information so I want to make sure that I'm trying to be as clear as I can and be as transparent as I can we have absolutely looked at adding a fourth person into that house we would love to do so it is still cost prohibitive even if the sprinkler system didn't have to be installed hmm. Do you utilize the shelter like Dr. Ford has the men's shelter, uh, Jerry O'Neill used to have the women's Extensively. shelter? Huh? Extensively. You do use Absolutely. those shelters? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, 15 to 20 percent of our accountability court participants are homeless when they come in. And, and so know, out of 94, that's 15 to 18 people. I know Jerry O'Neill, before he passed, told me that they were working on one car veterans. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, a facility for veterans. Did they ever... I don't believe that facility is online yet. Pardon? I do not believe that facility is online yet. Okay, but are they building one? I, I have seen a house with Dr. Ford um, that was for veterans, and that's the one that I'm talking about, and it's in the state of Vermont. Okay, all right. Thank you. I go back. Okay. Mr. Mitchell? So the, this particular grant that we're looking at, um, you're getting, however, how much how many more are there any, I guess, the, you, you said 94 actual participants that you're doing. Is that with this additional grant that adds to the helping of that or adding more to the, the cause of what you need in here, basically? This will sustain the numbers that we have that okay. allow us to continue to operate at this level. We continue to bring more people in every month. Right. Uh, we continue to lose a few every right. month, and those are some so that are losing is a good thing. They kind of are they losing to the degree of getting in a better place, or are they losing that you, you couldn't help? Them? I think that losing is a good thing in both regards because okay. we are graduating some participants okay. who have completed the process good. and doing well, and they're moving on with their life. We're also making sure that the people that we are serving are receiving the benefits and that we are seeing as the accountability portion of the courts, where we make sure that the money that we're investing is getting a return, that they're out, they're doing the things they need to, they're abiding by a crime-free lifestyle, right. they're getting jobs, they're finishing their education, they're doing all those things. If people don't do those things, they either progress through and graduate or we decide to separate ways. So is this money also being used to do the follow-up, the follow-through to assure that these guys are staying on track? Absolutely. Continuing to be a, continually a, a productive uh, member of society and so on. Absolutely. We do have an aftercare component in our program. After they're done with us, they come back. They can come back to classes. We have special groups just for them. Uh, we're always available. Our counselors are available. If they need individual sessions, if they hit something, we have that set up. Yeah. And um, I don't know, if, uh, you, you may or may not know this, but with the house that potentially in Lithia Springs, is, is that kind of moving in the right direction? I don't want to very much so. what you want to share, but it's very much so. It's, it looks to be promising that it might. Our partners there are very excited about working with us, and it's just a matter of detail. We just have to dot the I's and cross the T's. Got and it. make sure that everybody's satisfied and really walking into this eyes wide open. Right. I view this as essential as a partnership with the community mm -hmm. where we have a good partnership and they're receiving what they need to out of it and we're receiving what we need to out of it so that we can duplicate this effort and have other people do the same thing. And these funds could will be used in, in whatever it takes kind of in that direction as well. Or, Absolutely. Yeah. We will use our housing accountability line items for supporting those utilities. Again, a very small amount of money right. in the scrambles for that. But those participants in that house will be going through our program and receiving treatment dollars, transportation dollars, surveillance dollars. Absolutely. And all that's in this grant. Good. Okay. All right. I yield that. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the next tab, tab number eight, authorization to create a new position of accountability uh, court case manager to accommodate for the increased growth in the accountability courts, and you just mentioned that. As we have grown, our needs have grown as well. That means that it is time for us to request to bring a new person online. The good news is one of the increases pays for this person to come online. So this is approved in the grant, mm -hmm. and I am coming to the board to ask for approval and for us to work through our internal process to move that position forward so that we can start to look to hire someone. Any questions from the board on that one? It's pretty satisfying to us. Thank you. Tab number nine, authorization to approve a multi-year licensing agreement with the Chestnut Health Systems for the use of the global appraisal of individual needs, which is GANs, 
uh, assessment instruments and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. <laughs> this is a risk needs assessment that gives us a broader picture of the people we work with. And this is just, as we're moving forward, rather than having six solutions for, I need an assessment for mental illness and an assessment for substance abuse and an assessment for these other need areas, this global appraisal allows us to assess a complete person and gives us possibly a better picture of what we're working with so that we can figure out how we stage resources. Right now, I can say every person in our drug court has a very high need index for substance abuse, but there could be other needs that I'm not quite as aware of because I don't have the assessment instrument to tell me that. This is a validated evidence-based instrument. It is very reasonable. The reason why we're coming, this is going to be less than $1,000 likely for us to implement this, which in the terms of software for uh, case management and mental health and substance abuse is really a very low number. But the reason why it's important is because it's uh, been highly vetted uh, and allows us to look at a broader scope of how we deliver services as I'm looking to provide better services to our participants and to the people that we work with. We need to make sure that we're providing the right services to those people. That evidence-based uh, component is very critical, and I'm quite sure you have the research to back it up, so thank you for doing that. That sounds great. Uh, Commissioner Robinson, I believe I heard you. Yeah, th thank you, Madam Chair. Th this one, I, I saw, uh, I've got three questions. One, multi-year contract or license agreement. Um, can um, our contracts typically a one-year, I know that's for employment, but does that still apply to the cases of, of software that we're licensing? How does that First, just clarify that. I'm not that it's a prohibition in my mind for supporting it, but I just want to understand uh, we're committing to something that's over over time. Well, Jennifer's not here, but I'll, I'll try to remember what we were talking about. I apologize. I buried my dad last week, so I'm a little rusty today. Um, we would not approve a multi-year deal unless it has an annual way out. Right. By law, you have to have an annual way out. So if it is a multi-year deal for purposes of pricing, it has to have an annual way out. Mm -hmm. So between tomorrow, today and tomorrow, I'll make sure that that is in there. Um, do you know, Tim, off the top of your head, because Jennifer's not I here. have sent this to Jennifer, and she did approve it. We did go through the technology she, committee. I don't know about that specific issue. I don't remember it being a point of concern that she brought to me. Yeah, I don't think it is, and I'll check it just to make sure before y'all get it tomorrow. But it'll have an annual way out. Okay. Yeah, and okay. back, back to the, the point of, of the comments made earlier as far as fiduciary, we had to ask the question. Uh, There's something we always get hit on about um, the one year out, and it's something that we sort of keep as a point of, of, of reference for all contracts so that uh, there is uniformity and consistency in how we do things. So I, I appreciate you guys taking the time to answer that. Um, that, that being said, I'm going to move on to uh, you've answered my second question, which was had it gone through the technology committee, so it has, so therefore. I can check that one off. I'll keep moving. I'll keep moving. Number three is um, when it comes to the information, when you say we're using this tool, this tool is being used by who? And when I hear, just, and I know you're saying collectively, we, the court, but who's using this tool and how do we um, understand you know, information in, information out? Um, the quality of it is the degree of how it's put in there. Tell us a little bit about operationally who uses this tool and, and, and <coughs> what is information shared? Is it part of a broader index of information that's shared with the state? Talk to us a little bit just about that. Don't go, don't, don't be technical, but just can you give sure. a little insight? Absolutely. So this will be used by a few sections of people. So I'm just going to break through kind of chronologically how I see it would be used. Okay. Uh, a person it applies to the accountability courts. We do a validated risk need assessment on that person. Uh, it's not just I think that I need admission to the accountability courts. We have testing that confirms. No, no, you do actually need to be here. We agree. So that's the first piece, and that's where this lives, is, is that assessment piece. Uh, our treatment providers are the first and primary users of this information. And as a treatment provider, what I need them to be doing is clinically saying, these are the needs we should be addressing, and this is what we feel should be addressed in what order. Because to be perfectly honest, the needs are vast. And you have to triage. You have to say, okay, let's, let's stop bleeding over here first, and then we'll worry about these other things. And so as you work through those, you're working down a list of needs. Uh, the second uh, 
set of people that will have access to a global view of this will be our team. That's the judge, the prosecutor, the public defender, the treatment provider, surveillance. We all meet as a team several times a month and discuss all of our cases, including the cases that are being admitted to the accountability courts. And so they'll get a broad overview. There's a confidentiality statement for that team, so they all keep it in that team. They don't act on it outside of right. the realm of the court because our confidentiality won't allow that. So they're the second uh, viewers of that information. And then lastly will be case management. Uh, one of the people that we'll be hiring here will be one of those persons, and our senior case manager, Karen Alexander, myself, as we're doing a case management role, that case management is really those daily life activities. What does housing look like for you? What does employment look like for you? What does transportation look like for you? And while we can assess those on a personal basis, uh, having an assessment that gives us something to work off of to say, now we're working with treatment, now we're working with the judge, now we're working with the team, so that we're all addressing the same things in the right order. Because what I feel might be important might not be what everybody else feels is important. So we need to agree and try to make the first priority the first priority and everybody deal with that at one time. You, you, you nailed it, Director. That's really what I was looking for. I was looking for just how you're going to deal with the information. Where does it go? Um, 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 mental health is something obviously we've talked about. Uh, it's been taboo, taboo for years, and now we're dealing with it uh, again, both on the front side before they get before you guys, and then obviously, as you mentioned, on the back side. But I was just, you know, what what, what was the protocol around the information? Is what I was trying to, you know, get a little bit of visibility into it. It looked like you did a good job as far as there's confidentiality, as acknowledgement. Un unlike, I guess, to a certain extent, in, in public safety, it's inherent in the oath. It's inherent how do you handle, um, you know, sort of criminal records and so forth. I just want to get a little bit more feel about the public um, component of mental health. So, you answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Are you? Yes, uh, Tim. Um, this is software, right? It is. Uh, do you still have a psychologist or whatever, or whoever, that will interview this person, each person, to see what their physical needs are? We do. Uh, uh, we have and. We have uh, a psychologist available. Primarily our assessments are done by uh, certified specialists, addiction specialists, mental health specialists. Um, Is it not Dr. Harrington? Um, Dr. Harrington is still Karen. available to us, but our needs outgrew his ability to service them. We had a lot of work to be done. You have a firm that does this now. Ascension you? Counseling does primarily most of our substance abuse assessments uh -huh. and Tanner Medical does primarily our mental health assessment. Okay, and they, they're the ones that would detect whether or not the person has is bipolar or something like that. I, you know, I run the addictions program at my church on Friday right. nights, and I would say 50% of the people that have abused drugs, at least 50%, are bipolar also. I don't know, is it a result of the drugs? Yes, ma'am. Uh, which came first, but I just know that it just seems to be hand in hand. As we deal with the addiction population, the national numbers mirror what you've said, actually, that 67 to 70 okay. percent of those in severe addiction nationwide yes. have a co-occurring mental illness. Yes. And yes. so that's how they view that, inf that's how they relate that information, but they're saying the very same thing that you are. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we've had people that cut themselves. Yes, ma'am. All sorts of, they like to hurt themselves. So, um, but you still have, I guess what I'm trying to say, you still have on staff or in, on contract, contract. Uh, someone that, a person that will interview each one. I do, and this will not replace the person. This will give those persons better tools. Oh, okay. Thank you. <coughs> I yield back. Mitchell, Mitchell asked me, you attorney. Oh, okay. Yes. So the software, it's, I guess you, you feel confident it has been proven. I guess you've got, you've got some history yes. with some other county, some other, you know, some, some kind of a use. We're not the first ones to okay. use this software. Okay. We're, We're nowhere near the first ones to use this yeah. software. It is a nationally recognized uh, mm -hmm. tool. Got it, yeah. And, and, and is there an annual fee for maintenance fee and that kind of stuff that will go along with this outside of, uh, I know you said it's like $1,000 or less or something like that. You said. That includes that number. Uh, yes, there is a fee. There's a five-year fee of about $100 mm -hmm. 
every five years we'll pay a hundred dollars. That's a yes. very low number. Right. Uh, there is a yearly user <coughs> fee right. that comes in based on the number of users you will use. I believe it was two hundred and fifty-four dollars mm -hmm. uh, per user. We have about three people that we're going to put in. That's why I say less than a thousand dollars because, and that will be every year. Those user fees. Got it. Got it. I, I remember this. Now. That's all. Commissioner got to ask about this. The other question I want to go back to number number eight though. Is that a full time or a part time position for this accountability court? <coughs> full time. That, that's full time. Full time. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, I yield back. Okay. Right. Madam Chair, I, th I think I can address Commissioner Robinson's question. This is really a two part agreement. And I, Russ, if I say this wrong, tell me because it's technical. <laughs> but so long as you're we're not buying software, we're using their software. You're getting a license. I think it's a hundred dollar per provider, yes. if I'm not mistaken, for the license. The license continues as long as you're accessing the site. Mm -hmm. And then so that's why it's a multi year deal. It's really not a it's not a recurring thing. It's while you're using it. Mm -hmm. And then the actual data use agreement with Chestnut, which is phase two, essentially terminates when you no longer provide them information through the site. So because you're dealing with health records and requirement for HIPAA and everything else, the way the agreement for Chestnut concludes other than a material breach, which you can terminate at any time for a material breach, it, it says specifically, and I just hit my finger. Um, I apologize, I had it up. The agreement shall become effective on the effective date and shall terminate when data is no longer being provided, created, used by, disclosed to, maintained, transmitter received by Chestnut on behalf of the site. So essentially, it's sort of a self-effectuating thing. As long as you're using the site and providing Chestnut access, then the agreement stays in place because it's mostly dealing with health, health information. Mm -hmm. When you shut Chestnut off from the site, then it just it self-effectuated the termination. So I, I think that's why we passed it in legal because it, while it says it's a multi-year, multi it's really a use. When you stop using it, it ends. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? I believe so. I wish you could call me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. So there's no notice need to give. Uh, unless there's a material breach, and then you got to give them, I think, notice in 15 days to cure. But if you just wind down the site, essentially, there's probably a recurring charge to them because we don't know how many provide. We don't know how many times that hundred dollar hit is going to take place. You're managing based on your estimated use of the so right now the information you'd be provided to the site. Is that correct? This is what I expect for us to use this next year. In in three years, we will likely be spending a little more on it because we will be adding users to it right. and getting more people to do assessments and use that data as we move forward. Mm -hmm. But this is what I see for this year. That's absolutely correct. And I don't see this <coughs> moving forward at an exponential rate. In five years, I don't see how it could be fifteen hundred or even two thousand dollars. This is a, a fairly low number, but it is something that, because it's multi-year, it does require the board's approval. And transparency is never a problem for us. We want you to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and Tim, maybe address this. So the data input is being provided by y'all. How do you remove the data so Chestnut's no longer using it right. if you want to self effectuate a termination? So we would move to a separate system, as I understand, and that separate system that we start using begins their countdown, number one. They would provide us notice and say, is something wrong? Yeah. <laughs> is everything okay? But my conversations with their sales team and their, I don't think he was the vice president, I think he was the clinical director. I can't remember the actual title of the person I was emailing back and forth. Uh, but that we're taking the data, we're putting the data in, it is managing that data for us, giving us valuable feedback we're inputting that into our case management system and operating off of it kind of solely from that point forward. We can go back and historically look at something, but the need to go back and look at historical data will be low. Uh, we would reapply the instrument over time. That's another benefit to this process, which most people won't care about, but if we're doing our job, your scores should come down. Uh, just like managing blood pressure or bl managing blood sugar, if you're doing what you're supposed to and you're a very high risk need index to begin with, if what we do works, you should fall to moderate and then fall to low, and that should be how things work. So we'll be able to reapply this instrument moving forward. Uh, but finding the new instrument would be 
right. the, the key to moving forward. And, and certainly be. transferability. Absolutely. Can, can, Russ, are you comfortable that we can take this information away because the self-termination, depending upon us no longer providing access to the information to begin with, are you comfortable that can actually happen? Because your eyes are over there. No, it's you not, should be up here talking. No, it's no, not. I, I think you know, I, I'll go real loud. Um, <laughs> I don't have any confidence at all that we can remove the data once we've given it to them. They aggregate the data globally across all their users nationwide to provide reporting. Um, I saw nothing in the contract where it said we could remove our data. Now, the European Union, they passed new laws uh, where every software provider who gathers data has to provide an option for all users to remove their data once they terminate. Uh, that is not the case in the United States. So I am not aware of how we would remove our data once we provided it to them. Well, we're going to add a sentence that makes this easy, that right. we can give them 30 days notice that we're terminating, and they have to give us back a data. And that will make it easy. data. Yeah, because if you can't remove it under right. this contract, theoretically, the, game, the contract's still in place because they're maintaining right. information on your behalf. So we just add a sentence to it and fix it, Tim. Very good. Okay. Okay. Any other questions before we move forward to the next one? Thank you so much, um, Mr. Floyd. Uh, tab number 10, authorization to approve the contract for Lalita B.A as an assistant public defendant in state court in order to fill a vacancy. Hello, um, public defender Miles, how are you today? I'm great, thank you, good morning. Good morning. So this is a request to uh, approve a contract for an assistant public defender in the state for Ms. Baye. It's not asking to create a new position, we're not creating, we're just filling a vacancy that's been created by one of the attorneys in our office, has resigned and moved on to another position. So. We promoted a few people up from state court into the felony spot that was vacated, so we now have that vacant position left in state court. So we're asking that this be approved so we can hire someone to fill that vacancy. Okay. Any questions from the board? Commissioner Robinson? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, real quick question, and, and again, I always ask this question every year when doing the annual budget process, but, but I figure I'd bring it up. Um, you know, in comparison to, to the the district attorney's office as it relates to attorney to attorney, pound for pound, there's always a, a disparity. And, on, 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 there's not an equilibrium per se, but it's the way it is. Right. Um, it, it is what it is. How are we doing so far as it relates to being able to keep up with cases? Um, are, are you, how are you doing? We're, do, we're, I mean, we're doing our job. It's getting hard because I keep losing, I've been losing attorneys to more lucrative pay. In, in the private sector and so I've lost obviously two this is the second time I've been here this year asking for um, an approval to have a vacancy filled so it's when you lose experience it makes it a little hard and I don't want to lose anybody else because we have a great team of attorneys and as you heard Mr. Pruitt just talked about the growing with the accountability courts I have one person you know the solicitor has somebody the DA's office had two people we have one person who has to serve all, works with all the folks that are in all the accountability courts the DUI the misdemeanor drug court the felony drug courts felony mental health court so we'll definitely be asking for additional staff come October November whenever we do our budget request I know it asked last year we weren't able to get it for this current calendar year but so, if that answers your question. No, no it, it did. And that's, again, we try to, um, in this forum, have a, a, a public awareness of, of sort of what things we can anticipate on down the road. And, and again, so it's not like, you know, we try to make, make it, you know, everybody has to pay attention to sort of what's being said. So, all right. So, my, my second question then becomes, um, how many people do you have? That, that was really There's where 23 was. of us. 23? Including eight, yes. 23 total. 23. And again, we serve state court and felony court. We work in magistrate court. So you're you're multiple. You, you do it all, whereas over there, they're dedicated, what it sounds like. You had attorneys over there was dedicated, um, maybe at, um, that, is that correct? They're dedicated to mental health, but they're dedicated to uh, a certain court, whereas yours, yes. you got to cover everybody. That's correct. We have one receptionist that takes care of all, all of the courts. So. I got it. Understood. Understood. I yield to my colleague, Madam Chair. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Attorney Miles, thank you. Uh, tab number 11, authorization to renew the contract for administrative solutions for the administration of an inmate of inmate medical claims and inmate reinsurance for the period of July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Um, 
Major Holmes. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. This is the annual contract renewal for administrative solutions. They are the ones that handle all of our insurance involving inmates that leave the facility and get, whether it be the uh, emergency room hospital, whether it be um, doctor visits, dialysis, things like that. Um, this year, uh, the, the fee, the administration fee, stays the same as it has. There's a slight increase in the uh, stop loss insurance premium. It went up like 25, 25 cents per inmate, which uh, last year it was $98,817.60. This year's premium uh, will be $100,857.60, which is an increase of 2%. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll answer any questions. Okay. Any questions from the commissioners? Pretty self-explanatory. Thank, Thank you. you. Major Holmes. Tab number 12, authorization to approve a contract with Kimley Horn in the amount of $9,800 to complete work elements to the Sweetwater Master Plan to be submitted to the Atlantic, Atlanta Regional Commission for acceptance as a livable, livable consenters initiative. LCI and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Director Robert, sign you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, so last year the Economic Development Authority contracted with Kinley Horn to produce the Sweetwater Master Plan. The ink was still dry on this document when I took, took uh, started back in January. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it and it was a very well put together plan. Um, I took it to the Atlanta Regional Commission and I had them look it over to see if it could qualify as a retro LCI level centers initiative. And they sent me back, they looked it over and they, there were some elements missing, the analysis portions and things like that. So they're uh, amenable to retroing this document. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with Eric Bosman, is here from Kimley Horn. He worked on the original uh, plan uh, with uh, Chris Pumphreys. The uh, as a refresher, these LCIs, they since tw since 2000, they provided 172 million dollars worth of transportation funding through 63 different LCIs in the region, 105 projects. These are design, build, construction. Predominantly, the mission of the LCIs is to uh, incorporate. Um, they have a, uh, provide access to a variety of travel modes. And so something like the Sweetwater Master Plan and the plans that were put forward in this could be uh, like the roundabout, the sidewalks, we've talked about trails and, and, those, and that connectivity to Sweetwater, that could be funded through LCI funding. Mm -hmm. And so that's what uh, I'm here today to ask for. And the funding source to me is we got some in our budget because I had an FTE that was funded since the beginning of the year. And we haven't filled that position. She starts next Monday. So we, that could be a funding source. Or it could be SPLOS funds. But I wanted Eric to uh, take a moment to kind of like update everybody on, on exactly the process that took place of the plan before I was here. Okay. Yeah. Sir, Thank you. As, as Mr. Roberts said, when the initial plan was put together, it was designed to be a community-based plan that would have an approved transportation concept, an adopted future land use plan, and then updates to the quality growth standards for the area. So all those things were accomplished. The difference between what the study was originally designed to do under the Economic Development Authority and the LCI program is the LCI program has a list of 10 goals that need to be met. Now, it so happens that in working with the community and the Economic Development Authority, all of those LCI fundamentals are in the plan, but they're not reported in the way that LCI uh, has in their contracts, where they have contracts with local uh, government sponsors in order to put that together. So really what the scope of work is here is to go back through the plan and put the information that ARC wants to see in the ARC format. It's essentially adding a chapter to the document. So everything will still be consistent with everything that we did in the community-based process with all of the neighborhoods, with all of the local stakeholders. We just need to add that chapter that clearly defines the housing strategies, the transportation projects, 
and the potential for ARC to participate in future funding, both of supplemental studies, which is one pot, where you can do a deeper level of study and, you, and apply to ARC for funding, and or for the transportation improvements, as Mr. Roberts mentioned. So this essentially gives us the funding to go in and add that additional chapter, work with your staff and the Economic Development Authority to review it, make sure that everything is consistent with the original plan, and then bring it back to you all, the Board of Commissioners, for consideration and adoption. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Guider. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Eric Bosman. Eric, okay, I'm sorry. I uh, wanted to ask you something about the LCI. Um, LCI grants are usually um, directed toward residential, retail, restaurants, things like that. Um, this is uh, manufacturing that's out there. Uh, sidewalks, uh, don't know, the sidewalks would be for whom, and there's a lot of vacant property out there still that has not been developed. Are we putting the uh, cart before the horse on this, or is, is this a good time to be doing this? Yeah, so the, the funds we're actually talking about are federal transportation dollars that are through the LCI program. So any of the grant funding that we would be looking to gain through this process of getting it grandfathered are all transportation dollars. But when you say transportation, what kind of transportation are you talking about? So, there's streets already out there. Right, but in the plan there are intersection improvements, there are trail proposals, and there are sidewalk proposals. And if this plan is grandfathered by ARC, then you would be eligible to apply to ARC um, to get LCI funds to help offset the cost of constructing those improvements. So how many years would it be able to sit out there without us utilizing it before we could, uh, I mean, does it have a time period that so runs that. out? Yeah, initially when you adopt an LCI plan, you have a five-year action plan as long as at least once every five years you update or readopt the five-year action plan, then you stay eligible in the program. So uh, you're talking about, you said bike lanes? Uh, that was some of the pro uh, concepts that were identified in the master plan. There was, uh, there was intersection improvements, as, as Eric mentioned, the, the multi-use path and following the power transmission lines, uh, sidewalks along Thornton Road. I think we, that was a safety issue with, with Earlier this morning. But um, most of the things out there are, they don't have high employment out there. They have a lot of traffic, tractor trailers and things like that, because you've got bays on both sides of the buildings and things. The truck drivers aren't going to be walking down paths, I don't think. But, uh, well, we, we what about, I mean, it just, now I can see from the residential apartments over to the Part, but I don't think is this what this is for. Well, the uh, along the corridor there, the, the plan actually identified some residential areas in there. You know, now you've seen the build out. We we we've all seen the build out of that area uh, commercially, but there is a, a residential component in the plan, and it was identified. The parcels were identified, and and the discussions that took place in the formation of the plan involved uh, potentially. Uh, maybe connectivity to the other side of Sweetwater Park back in there because that would, that would if, that, if, that, if there was a, another entryway into the back of Sweetwater, that would help out the hotels and... But that road's not even built yet. That's correct, but if we had... The, that roundabout's not even built. So. Well, the, these funds, too, the, the, the LCI was just recently utilized by Emory University and built a, a roundabout. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, because that's a pedestrian and, and safety component that would be a, a funding. Do we already have the plan of where the streets are going to go, where buildings are going to be facing, what what side, of, if it's a corner lot, what side it's going to be facing? So where, where streets are going to go, yes. I mean, when the commission adopted the plan, my understanding is they adopted concept A as the desired transportation plan. Right. So that's an adopted transportation plan that generally has the roadways laid out and differentiates between residential purpose roads versus industrial purpose roads to try to separate some of the truck traffic from the car traffic. Now in terms of design and where the buildings are going to go, uh, 
I believe you have updated the quality growth standards for the area, so there are additional policies and regulations for that, but the plan itself did not dictate where buildings specifically would go. It looked at the overall broader piece of land use and trying to update the future land use plan for residential versus commercial uh, properties. Uh, I don't see how we can determine where sidewalks are going to go when we don't know where the driveways are going to go. <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, how much of how wide the driveways are going to go. This is just a plan to draw out something that's going to have to be re redrawn once construction starts filling in the vacant lots. Uh, uh, bike trails and trucks don't mix. I think we found that out. Uh, and I don't know why bike trails would even be part of that. Now, walkway from the apartments, I can see that, but I don't, as I said, the road's not even built, been built yet. I don't, we don't even know where the road's going to go, so how can you draw out the plans for the sidewalk? So, <laughs> uh, I just think we're putting the cart before the horse here. Anyway, I yield back. Okay. Um, Commissioner Robson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I appreciate the comments. You know, it, it, this, the master planning process, and again, um, it's not to defend the work, but you guys did a, a very good job for us in laying out a foundation of how to, how to plan. You think about Douglas County, at least for the past 10 years, I've had a chance to observe, sort of just sprawled, right? There was no thought about how to lay out land use, how to align economic development, transportation, and so forth. So you guys did a really good job of helping harness that. Um, a very good public education component, a lot of participation both from the developers, um, development side, as commercial and residential side. I mean, it was just, it was a great experience. And it set the blueprint for Villa Rica, downtown, um, Lee Road. I mean, it was, it's so thank you for that. And we, we appreciate the learning we got. But in that process, when you think about one more time, Thornton Road, it's density. It's not the West. And so now you've got to balance both residential and commercial since they come right up alongside each other, right? You put them right next to each other. Decisions of the past put residential and that heavy duty commercial together. So part of the whole process was like, look, the residents said, look, y'all got to better than this. Give us a buffer, right? And the whole buffer was about making sure that uh, we talked about bike lanes. I was just on Red Riverside and saw bike, you know, people going down the street. And there's got to be a balancing act that says that uh, with a state park, with doesn't matter how many houses are there, their voice mattered, and their voice mattered to such a point where uh, whether it's apartments, whether it's not, that like, look, can we at least get to Thornton Road without being hit by something? Can you put something in place whether it's a bike lane, whether it's a pedestrian path, and that was part of the conditions. One more time, it ain't always about up or down. I hope this board gets this. It's not always about up or down, yes or no. Some things are conditional. And the, the residents weighed in on this. You guys did a great job of capturing it. And all it's supposed to do is provide us with a blueprint and a guide to the future. In other words, it, it, it helps us. And you know, what, what I'm hearing you do with this LCI is enhance, um, uh, enhance our opportunity to access funds that may be out there, uh, which we were always about was leverage our local dollars for both the state and the feds, which we're consistently doing. And so as I, as I listen to this, and it, again, it's, it's, I'm hearing this for the first time, uh, and I, I gave that as background because I'm, I'm not questioning the future. It is the future. Um, developers have to come in here. They've got to spend their money. They've got to get to a place where we even come alongside of that. I know, Miguel, you've been working alongside me. Again, we've got a new leadership group, both Robert, Ron Roberts, Miguel, these guys are trying to come up and take us to a whole other level. In other words, what we might have done for the past 10, 20 years has changed. We've now got a new leadership group that's trying to affect, like, okay, here's a way that we can really enhance. Let's be strategic about how we're doing things. And I, I, I want to say, staff, thank you for that. Um, but the money, as far as how do you fund this, um, and this is going to go back to um, Director Roberts, um, it, you needed a staff member. so. The question is, I don't know if I would support you using your own. I mean, that was the whole point of you asking for it, and, and, and now to compromise that for this, at least unless you're saying we're going to wait for a whole year for you to pick up that staff member if you use this money. Um, um, economic development is something that Chris Pumphrey, and he's not here, or maybe is he here? No. No, he's not uh, here. All right. That he can speak to using, are we talking about the economic development component of the SPLOS as a funding? Yes, sir. All right. How, much, how much is it? It's $9,800. Right. But he, he also stated, I mean, he hadn't hired the person yet, so their funds 
he's got a half a year's worth of that salary available. If he needs it. Yeah, if he really just spend it on a good budget. I won't manage how you, you work that out. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that, Madam Chair, as it is. So, but be, be specific about where the funds is going to come from by tomorrow if we get to that point. It, it, it has to be either or. Can we, Madam Chair? Yeah, and I recommend it comes out of SPLOS. It does deal with the economic development portion of the of the SPLOS. Okay. I'll wait till my peers say something. If they want to say anything, then I have no problem. Okay. <laughs> any comments from you? Any other comments from board commissioners regarding this? I know we'll work it out by tomorrow. And it's, it's stated, be stated accordingly in tomorrow's meeting. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we'll Thanks move on to the next. Thank uh, you all very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, tab number 13, authorization to accept funds in the amount of $3,447.69 from the Georgia Trauma Commission 2018 round two grants and amend the fire department's budget. Uh, Deputy Chief. Deputy Chief right. Zachman with the fire department. Uh, yeah. Chief Spencer's out of town from a standing board. This uh, is a Georgia Trauma Commission uh, grant. They awarded us one grant already this year for $7,500, and they contacted us and had more money available. Um, so we're uh, asking that you accept another $3,447.69. And what we do is we buy trauma um, supplies for our ambulances with this grant. Any questions from the board of commissioners or comments? Okay, Commissioner there's, Mitchell. There's, there's no match there. Just, no, sir. Just, no, sir. The money's to just kind of to help us. Yep. Equipment. Yep. That's my thought. Okay. Very good. Thank you, okay. Deputy Chief. All right. Last but not least, tab number 15, authorization to. Oh, you have to miss it. Oh, I'm sorry. Number 14. I didn't, I didn't see it. Number 14. That's why you weren't moving. Yes, <laughs> like, <laughs> authorization to enter into an agreement with Target Solutions Learning LLC for web hosting of online continuing education portal for the fire department at a cost of $16,631 in paid SPLOS bonds and authorize, an authorized chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Deputy Chief again. Yeah, this is a recommendation from the Fire EMS Committee, and it's already been in front of you and, and voted uh, in favor. We just didn't have the verbiage right and didn't include the part where you were to sign the contract with them. So all we're asking now is that the contract uh, be signed. It's a two-piece deal with uh, Target Solutions, and then to make it compatible with the state where our training hours go directly to the state, we're going to come back next time. The uh, contract wasn't available for it for another 3000 to make it uh, where it would report straight to the state. So we're, it's a total price of 20000 that we voted on, or that you guys voted on and approved. We're only able to do 16000 of it today. The first contract and the other contract will be ready shortly. Okay. Any questions from the board commissioners or comments? Uh, Deputy Chief, I do have one comment. Thank you so much for um, with this LLC for the web hosting for our online continuing <laughs> education because that really had an impact on that ISO rating, you know, because of the education and all the things that are involved with our staff and not only that one particular component. But if you could, could you just share with us about the great news on the ISO rating? Is it already? Yes, ma'am. We got the uh, uh, report back from the ISO and we are now a 3, 3X. So we've moved from a three or from a four to a three. Then um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I if I remember right, it, we're one of 35,000 depart or 35,000 departments in the in the country that this company rates. So it's a scale of one to ten. Ten is worst, one is best, and we are now three. So a lot of hard work behind it, and a lot of help from you guys, and it's it's paid off. Congrats! So, Congratulations! Yep, we look to improve it even more in the future. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board? Comments? Thank you, Deputy Chief. Okay, tab number 15, authorization to approve a car allowance agreement for Valerie By, Assistant District Attorney, and Brett Adams, Assistant District Attorney, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, Attorney Ron? I'll handle that, okay. uh, Madam Chair. Um, the District Attorney wasn't able to come. Okay. So these are new people in positions that were current. The previous employees that were in these positions had car allowances. So it just changes the car allowances into their name. Okay. These 
people do they need to come before the board of commissioners to be approved not these not these well they already have they have yes but not carl else well he he does <coughs> the district attorney can hire whoever he wants to i'm not sure yeah. these are county or state employees but <clears throat> the car allowances have to be approved by you and essentially it's not yeah. a change in the budget you're just changing the person who gets the allowance yeah, the same allowance. for one person is right. shift okay budget neutral any questions for the board commissioner yeah um, commissioner Ross. Yeah. Can, can you confirm for us the, the comment about not paying for the board of commissions can you just clarify for us ken by tomorrow that, that, that they are not um our employees because i hadn't seen these names they, before they would be county employees yeah they're true they're county employees. they are county employees yes but not contract. But not contract. If they were contract, they would have to come before the board. Let me let me fix this that. before we get a big mess here. Please. My whole point is <laughs> uh, in the <clears throat> in the district attorney's office, you have people that are funded exclusively by the state mm -hmm. as a baseline, and you have people, and we supplement, I guess, a lot of them or some of them. Mm -hmm. You also have people that are furnished through to by the county to the DA to supplement the carrying out of the duties. So whether they're a state employee or whether they're a county employee may, may not matter. This attorney can hire who he wants to hire as long as it's a position that's allotted. I don't remember if there is anybody in the district attorney's office that's a contract lawyer like you have for public, uh, public defenders, like you have for juvenile court or other job. I'm, I'm not sure. And Bill may know. I, I'm not, I don't think so. I think it just simply means what bucket their pay is coming from and what retirement system they may or may not be eligible to. So. Does that answer the question, Commissioner Robinson? I just wanted to hear what the response was because yeah. I, I just, which, which, okay, we're, we're leaving it at that for right now. Um, you, you clarified, and again, I was willing to take it offline, but I wasn't, you're right, I didn't want to try to right. make this bigger than what it was really intended to be with my question. All right, so now I'm going to go on so I can yield to my colleagues. So this um, car allowance, um, so it trans, so who gets the car allowance? I, I should know this already, but I just want to do it for the record. Who gets car allowances in the county? Kind of administrator. Like, what function? Like, the county administrator gets a car allowance. I mean, what, what's the tier of car allowances? How does it work? One more time. Um, there are multiple people that okay. that the board has approved car allowances okay. for. Is it by title, directorship? Is it by function? Um, a judge gets it. I'm just making it's it just, up. I don't it's know. different. It's all. Yeah. Well, I'll have to get you the list. I don't know right off hand. It's a big list. It's a big list. All right, but but this function here, we believe that this person warrants our car loans. So some kind of way they fall in the policy under the board of commissioners that this person, this function, is eligible. Yes, is sir. Because these you positions have previously received car allowances from the board. I understand. And, and again, I'm only asking is that I just don't remember because this group, to, to Ken's point, tends to be independent of us. I don't. I'm not as familiar with it. I, unlike general government, and so. Um, I, I was just asking because it, it's not should they be grandfathered or does it does it really comport with policy? Like a lot of things we do, we have a policy, and sometimes we get outside of policy just by practice. I just asked the question, which is, does this role if it fits, it fits? I, I, I want to avoid precedent. I just want the question answered. Does this role fit the current policy? It's either yes or no. I don't want to get into yeah. who got it in times past, but that may not be accurate. It may not be right. So keep it separate. I'm not trying to go backward. Can I answer? I'll try to answer yeah. the question. These are assistant DAs who yeah. will go to crime scenes, who will go to witnesses to go meet with them and interview them, who will go to the lab potentially. So part of the function of this job is outside. In fact, a large part of a prosecutor's job outside the courtroom is not in the courthouse. It's on the street somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if you just ask me, do I think there is a function for a car in these jobs? It typically is. Now, at the broader question, when we went from taking uh, Crown Victorias from prosecutors and everybody else at some point in time and, and came up with that policy, I can't answer the broader question. But theoretically, these people could come to work and ask to be assigned a car to go do a county function, come back and go get in a car to go home. 
uh, at some point the county changed that policy to control correct cost and so I, I would say my the county attorney's present uh, position is uh, these people aside from law enforcement are probably on the streets as much as anybody doing their job at least a part of their job in my opinion so right. does that help yeah it, it does and I because I, I was very keenly aware because I was here during that time when we did take back cars and we, right. we took a certain position and, and we were again trying to work through that policy and we, we become a little bit more crystal in how we apply against that um, I'm going to yield to my colleagues I'm, I'm, I'm good for now thank you madam chair Commissioner uh, now this is a car allowance in other words they get paid for how they use their own car right on county business that we don't pay their back and forth to, That's right. to, to um, their house. This, this, this should be in lieu of all other moments related to And it's to taxable. They yes. get a 1099 at yep. the end of the year. They pay taxes yes. on it, just like you do any income. And if they were assigned a car, then this would automatically turn, well, they wouldn't get paid. That's correct. In other words, right. if they're not, they have to not be in a county right. car. You can't right. have both. Right. right. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Okay. And just, just also a clear remark. Um, in past, in, in, in the past, pretty much, this would have actually. That's what the DA prior uh, assistance received. Car rates is correct. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So. All right. How you? Okay. All right. Um, any other comments before we move on? We're making good time today. All right. Um, any other discussion? Uh, with the Board of Commissioners or from you all before we move forward. Um, we have a board appointment today, which is tab number 16, Department of Family and Children's Services and the Library Board. That'll be in the executive and session. The, okay. Um, all right. Uh, at this time, a term. Okay, Commissioner Robinson, you have a comment? Yeah, comment. yeah. Commissioner, comment. Sorry. All right, real quick, um, just again, trying to be consistent. Um, um, Director Hallman, can you give a, a quick uh, highlight of when in two weeks we'll have a finance committee meeting and, and so that people are somewhat aware? Yes, um, the finance committee meeting um, has been changed from the 23rd at 2 o'clock to the 19th at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, items on the agenda are um, an update on the tax abatement project from Terminus. Uh, the results uh, we're currently out to bid for the uh, lease purchase of the energy um, equipment due to the energy audit. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things that were on the control center. I'm missing a couple other things. Nope. Those are two major. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, County owned property? County owned property, yes. We'll okay. be discussing um, the list of current county owned property. We won't be making any recommendations or anything, but just something that we'll be bringing before the board um, during the mid uh, year retreat mm -hmm. in August. And that's all just to give a highlight, and, and those are sort of the major things we may add to the um, add to. Oh, and the digest. Oh, sure. Yes, gonna high, just a high level on the uh, the digest. I have not received the numbers yet, um, but we'll have the numbers by then. So we'll just kind of give a high level uh, overview of the digest that will be presented at the mid year retreat. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank, very good. Uh, and again, we're, we're just trying to again establish and enhance um, opportunity to communicate with the public. Miguel Valentin, can you? We I know we just had a couple of items on the transportation. Do you want to highlight those real quick? Yes, yeah, certainly, uh, Commissioner. <clears throat> We're going to be discussing um, a lot of project updates. Uh, we have a number of um, design efforts uh, where we've reached out to design consultants, and we're going through the process of uh, potentially a selection and identifying uh, the design consultants for at least two of the projects. Uh, we also will have an update on the uh, bus uh, system, the CMAP application uh, status, and uh, <clears throat> there's going to be an update uh, or a summary of the public outreach related to the bus routes. Uh, as well. Very good. That's it. Uh, th thank you very much, Director Valentin. And again, um, the, the agenda could be um, enhanced by then, but we do publish them. Um, County Clerk. 
how often, how soon do we publish them to the public? Like the final? 24 hours. 24 hours. So based on what was said today, this is more to give everybody a heads up. It could be enhanced, um, uh, amended um, prior to them, but 24 hours out, um, everybody will get the official agenda. I yield, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments before I move forward? Uh, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? Yes, ma'am, we need it for uh, legal, for personnel, and land. Okay, legal, personnel, and land. Board right. Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. So moved. We have a motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, so take a 10 minute break, so and I'll see you all in a second. All right, We're thank on. you. Any other questions or discussions from the Board of Commissioners? Nada. Okay, with that being said, this meeting is adjourned.